Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we're uh, we're tra we're going to Durham, North Carolina, to look at um, I'd say one of the stranger stories I've covered recently enough. Yeah, you've got travel. You got a guy who really loves the sound of his own voice, and you got uh contact lenses. That's a new one. It's fitting that the name Raven is in this one because we got a we got a few bones to pick. And a few baffling yokes to look at, like, along the way. Which we will get to when, of course, we, as always, give it a give. <music> Durham, North Carolina is home for us today. And you know, usually when I'm talking about, uh, the places in these old videos, they tend to be set in small towns a lot of the time. Which means I tend to run out of things to say, but this is like the opposite of that. But, I will say, my interest level remains the same. Non-existent. It's home to a number of universities, cultural institutions, many prominent companies, and over 275,000 people. Already pretty sweet, but you know, for us, as usual, it ain't the place, it's who's in it. That was the Abaroas on Ferrand Drive, North West Durham. Before they were the Abaroas though, they were Raven Abaroa and Janet Christensen. Raven and Janet were college sweethearts, meeting on a soccer ball field at Southern Virginia University. A school not just chosen for shits and giggles. It's a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint School. Based on the university's standards of conduct, it's also party central. Of course they met in the soccer field. There's literally nothing else to do. Don't know about you, but I'm not sure if I could have kept up with that, you know, code of conduct. Self-respect? Come on! Raven and Janet, they were both, you know, the athletic sort, and pretty soon they were in there like swimwear. Or that uh, funny underwear Mormons wear. Hmm, maybe this rule was easier to keep than I thought. Well, anyways, back to what I was talking about and Raven's rockin' 90s haircut. What a time to be alive. So Janet, who came from a big loving family, she had nine siblings, fell for the charming Raven when they met in 98, and fell hard. So hard that two years after they met, they married, in August 2000. Shortly after, they moved to a town called Smithfield, Virginia, quite a ways away from where they first met, and they settled in for their future lives together. They both then later on ended up getting jobs at the same sporting, a uh, goods company, and that, my friends, is how we end up back at the beginning. Back in Durham, NC. They ended up renting a house in the suburbs on Ferrand Drive. Things were going well, you know, they were trying for a baby. Just because you're trying doesn't mean you want to succeed. As usual, uh, going well until it wasn't going so well. In 2003, Raven told Janet that he was having an affair and he wanted to get going and be gone. He actually uh, had been seeing a couple of chicks on the side. And it was pretty much right after that that Janet found out she had a bun in the oven. For uh, Janet, Prince Charming over here turned into Prince Dickhead. But they reconciled. Raven Bird Boy, uh, yo, he came back. They ended up recon reconciling. He said, here, listen, done with that flandering stuff. No more, you know what? Come on, come on, come on. Let's bygones be bygones, and by God, I'm gonna be a papa. Not long after, they welcomed a baby together, Kaiden Abaroa. Now, Kaiden uh, was kind of uh, an accidental band aid baby, you know, as they say, because although they loved the kid, they didn't necessarily love each other, and things weren't great. Their finances were in shit shape, but their child brought them great joy. They ended up going to their church for help, which which they got, a few bob in the back pocket. They ended up being a couple of months behind on rent, and their landlord had to help them out. Their landlord helped them out, and he gave them a couple of months off the books. See, they were both working for a company called Sports Endeavors, a company that sells, well, balls. And either they were spending checks their ass couldn't cash, or they were being paid peanuts because they were always behind on bills. Even more so when the kid arrived, and eventually they became, uh, they became broker when they were both fired. This part of the story, Janet wasn't involved at all, 
The only involvement she had was her involvement with Raven. See, Raven, it turned out, had been stealing from the company. Like the birds. They do that, you know. This wasn't a crime of desperation, you know, gotta put food on the table. We just wanted the money, uh, you know. He had ordered 25 to 30 pairs of shoes, but had the merch delivered to his own home. Then sold the shoes himself under the username Footballer Guy. The supplying company eventually contacted Sports Endeavor, saying, uh, you never paid us. Sports Endeavor said, well, you never delivered it until they seen where it was delivered to, and well, yeah. Raven Navarro was charged with embezzlement in March 2005. Two months later, things went from bad to worse. On the evening of the 26th of April uh, 2005, Raven, he went off to play some soccer ball, you know, with his friends. He was still, he was still mad about it. He left the house at about 8 p.m., uh, you know, left Janet, Kaiden back in the house. When he left, she was in bed watching TV and it was all good. She was dozing off to sleep once again because she was pregnant for round two. When he arrived back home after 10 p.m., the house was dark. The house was quiet and in the bedroom, Janet was in the kneeling position, covered in blood. 25-year-old Janet Abaroa was dead. Nothing could be done when the emergency responders arrived. She was in a pool of blood. Raven, hysterical, croaking like his namesake, hyperventilating, believed she had done it to herself. Upon investigating, the cops soon, soon disagreed. She hadn't been shot like Raven said on the phone. She had been stabbed multiple times in the chest. Fingerprints and a footprint were found, a laptop missing, along with one of Raven's knives. And he was, he was a collector. That's my new knife got for Christmas. Thank you, bought it myself. My dad would be very proud, I like to collect knives. But diamond rings were left on the counter. The investigation was on, and although there were, you know, odd things in the home, there was no sign of any kind of forced entry into the house, and the door was locked. But Raven, hey, he was at soccer with his mates. And pretty soon he was somewhere else. That's somewhere else being not in the state of North Carolina. A few days after the murder, he upped and left. He went to Utah with his son to be with his family, which is fair, it's understandable, in this difficult time. But to others, it looked like he legged it. Right after the murder, he got an attorney and wasn't interested in talking to anyone, least of all Janet's large family who arrived with rewards for helping solve the case. Janet's family were from Pennsylvania and Virginia, um, and that's where she would go. She would go home to be buried in Antrim Township in Pennsylvania. Before she was buried though, Raven had a phone call to make because she had life insurance, baby! She had half a million, and although they had been having money troubles for a while, for days and days, Raven always made sure to pay the policy every month. Now, I hear you barking, big dog. You can see where this is going. Wouldn't be so sure about that. The footprints at the house and the fingerprints didn't match our birdie. Four months after Janet's death, Raven pled guilty to embezzlement charges and was sentenced to two years probation and ordered to pay back nearly $10,000. At this point, though, it was, um... It's kind of small potatoes compared to, uh, you know. Callie, do you mind if I interrupt for just one second? No, that's fine. Don't move my hand. I have. There's reasons. Where's my coffee? <laughs> okay. And we're off and running again. Okay. I don't, um, I don't like talking about what happened to her. 
And it's not because I don't love her, and it's not because I don't want to find out who did it, but it's because I have so many good memories with her that, you know, I hate thinking about the the bad times, you know, the time that, yeah, I can't, honestly, I can't even put that image in my head right now. Like, I, I refuse to even allow myself to think it because it's one of those things that, it, you know, it could break a person. Oh, the what ifs. You know, I have so many what ifs that, that just overwhelm me uh, from things like, well, what if I had gone to that other college, you know, and never met Janet? You know, I love her so much that I would have easily never met her just so I would have never put her in harm's way. Um, why would somebody enter this quiet home in a quiet neighborhood? Why would somebody harm someone so innocent, so kind as Janet, as my wife? And what what are the motives, you know? And so as I think about that, lots of scenarios play through my head. Um, the worst scenarios are scenarios that involve me, you know, involve... Was it somebody who was trying to get back at me? Was it someone who was breaking into my home because of something I did? And if that's the case, you know, how do you live with yourself? You know, because I didn't live the lifestyle that I should have been living because that offered an opportunity for people to want to seek revenge on me or to hate me or to, you know, just want to provide harm. And instead, you know, they encounter my wife and they end up harming her. It's just... It's not fair. My justice comes from just knowing, understanding that plan, that why, why is this allowed to happen? He really loved himself, I guess. He was, he was very mad. He's always mad to yap away. Uh, he even had his own website, Raven's Tree. Ugh. All right, so that's uh, done and dusted. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. I'm off. And so he flapped his wings and moved to Utah with a few a uh, few bob in his back pocket, his son and a new life that he was planning on starting. While he was having a grand old time in Salt Lake City, Durham was under the scope with this investigation and people were constantly inquiring about the state of it. Two years and no answers for the family of a murdered mother, Janet Abaroa, was killed two years ago. She was pregnant with her second child. For the first time, police are telling us Janet Abaroa's husband, Raven Abaroa, has not been eliminated as a suspect in this case. More and more questions were asked about a long gone Raven who met a woman in Salt Lake City named Vanessa Pond. And he was off to the races once more, now using his bereaved widower status to get some hoon tang. He told Vanessa that an intruder had broken in and ended Janet. Left it at that. You know, left out the parts where he was a major person of interest in the investigation. I'd leave it out too. It didn't take too long for her to learn what others were saying about him though. But Charming Raven was able to slow her roll, calmed her down, and convinced her he had no part in his wife's death. Raven and Vanessa then married. After, of course, Janet's family contacted her, told her, Big mistake! Big red X! But she still went ahead with it. And years, years would pass with no answers in the stabbing death of Janet um, Abaroa. So nothing good on that front. And nothing good on our other front. The marriage front, really. <laughs> you know, the sequel didn't do any better for Raven. Raven was a complicated guy. And that's rarely used as a compliment. See, Vanessa and Raven, well, over time he became more and more abusive. It started with words, and he worked his way up to physical abuse. Pushing her around, throwing her on the floor, and convincing her she tripped. That sort of thing. Suddenly, he's convincing that he never had anything to do with, you know, his previous wife, her death. It started to look like the old trickaroo. The marriage lasted less than six months, with Raven and Vanessa separating and getting the marriage annulled. He had me convinced that uh, everyone was trying to frame him. In the meantime, and I mean four years after the murder, nearly everyone suspected Raven of being behind it. He was unable to keep his story straight and consistent, but there was no direct evidence tying him to it, and any clues left behind didn't match Raven. But then again, they didn't match anyone. But what was odd was that if there was, you know, if it was someone else, there was no sign of a break-in, there were no signs of a disturbance, and Janet would have put up a fight. 
especially as she was she was pregnant and had her baby in the next room. At the end of 2009-2010, uh, a new detective took over the case. And one of the first things he did was call Raven, you know, who was all the way over in, in Utah. And Raven was a gas lad. He was a gas man because he had a habit of recording himself. And this was a recording he made when he just got off the phone with that cop. He seems to know shit is about to hit the fan. Um, I'll stay in touch if you can, if you can, if you make a person or, you know, want to give me these names and feel comfortable that, do that, and I'll talk with them. And, yeah, we'll go from there. Good. All right. All right, thank you. I appreciate your time. All right, we'll see you later. Uh -huh. myself getting frustrated. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why. I need to win the lottery. You know, if I were to win $3 million, I would dedicate $2 million to fighting this. <laughs> Two thirds of my winnings, if you would. Uh, and the rest would obviously go to secure the home, secure the future Caden. Um, so, oh, and to make Janet's uh, name more recognized than Southern Virginia. So I've got my work cut out for me. Jeez. Hey, win lottery. That's what I need, because this fight. You need money, you need power. Little vlogger over here, you know? Not odd at all. Wonder what else he records. Then the police made a big dent in the case when they had Janet's body exhumed for reasons that were odd. Contact lens reasons. Janet always took her contact lenses out when she was going to bed, as most people do. Thing is, her contact lens holder was empty. When searching the house, they never found them. So where could they be? Well, I found out when they exhumed her body. They were a little dissolved, but largely intact. And this, once again, was another inconsistency in Raven's story. If she was wearing them, she wouldn't have been in bed, as he said she was when he last saw her. Digital forensics also turned up uh, something. Remember how his laptop was missing from the house? Well, they ended up discovering some uh, CDs, multiple CDs, and on them, was pretty much everything that would have been on his laptop. So he had backed up everything from his laptop and the date of those backups, him downloading everything, was the 25th of April, 2005, which is the day before Janet was murdered and his laptop was stolen. Miraculous fucking time. Perhaps he should have beefed up his home security instead. I wonder what they found on those CDs. Here's a final recording. Another was that on the way home, Raven stopped in a convenience store and there was security footage. However, when the police arrived at his home, he was wearing a different top, so he had he had time to change. One month after this video, so I've got my work cut out for me. Raven was arrested. Pam Raven Abaroa is charged with murdering his pregnant wife Janet in April of 2005. Durham police arrested Abaroa at his home in Montpelier, Idaho. Today, he did not resist. In 2013, Raven Abaroa went on trial. It was a circumstantial case. I believe he said to me that, uh, that she had asked him, why do I hurt so bad? But a lot of women took the stand and talked about Raven and his character. Women he had had affairs with while married to Janet. And they talked of him being, being violent. And then of course, Vanessa Pond. She was one of the star witnesses and she took the stand. When he sees weakness or a woman crying, he just comes at you harder and harder. He told me how much he hated me and how much he didn't care if I died. And he expressed how much he wanted to hit me. And he swung his hand back 
and he stopped right before he hit my face. He got in my face and laughed at me for flinching and then left as he left the room. I then had to compose myself and be late to my bridal shower. The defense in the meantime had the footprint, the fingerprints, no evidence physically linking Raven to the scene, and a canine dog, which when brought to the house led police to a creek out back where the trail ended. Signs that somebody else was in the home. The farther away from that crime scene and that trail you get in this case, ladies and gentlemen, the greater the chance that an innocent man is convicted of murder. At the end of all the evidence, we will ask you to return the only appropriate verdict in this case, and that's not guilty. After five weeks, long enough trial, the jury was sent off to try and, you know, reach a conclusion. After three days, they reached one. And by one, I mean none. I don't think that additional time spent deliberating is going to allow us to change our final outcome. We can't make you reach a verdict. The system is not designed to make you reach a verdict. It allows you to attempt to decide these cases. Only you can do it. Eleven wanted a guilty verdict, one not guilty, and they were at an impasse. And so the judge declared a mistrial. It was approximately a year later that Raven's second trial was set for. And as it inched closer, well, well, it didn't happen. Raven Abaroa entered an Alfred plea for voluntary manslaughter. He admitted he killed her, but not that he murdered her. And even then, not really. So I would just like to state that I didn't receive a fair trial the first time. I don't think I'll receive a fair trial the second time. And the fact is, I love my family very much. And I don't think it's worth risking the possibility of spending the rest of my life in prison for something I need to do. I take this plea to ensure that that doesn't happen. And that's the only reason I did not kill my wife. An Alfred plea is when you know they have enough to convict you, but you're not saying you did it, just that you know they'll find you guilty. I did it, but I didn't do it. So just this, you know, a satisfactory conclusion, no, he was sentenced to 8 to 10 years in prison, given credit for time served. He had already spent 4 years in jail before the trial and when it was on. So he, so he didn't really have to spend a whole lot of time behind bars at all. On Christmas Day 2017, he was a free man. And he now lives in Utah. So yeah, that's the story of that one, you know. And it kind of... just sort of ends. No, uh, no definitive uh, conclusion. Janet's family don't think they got real justice. Uh, it's like he can't even really say he did it, being an Alfred plea. It's kind of a, kind of a get out of jail free card. Although he spent time behind bars, yeah, not a whole lot. It's more of a kind of like a, I'll dip my toes then bounce card. So I guess we can't really say what happened, because an Alfred plea is quite frustrating and we may never know what happened, truly. So it's a big question mark, you know, wink wink on this one, but with our Birdman, all his gallivanting, his videos, what a lot of women said about him, kind of guy who was, what happened that night? Pff, I don't know. It's a real thinker, all right. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do so. Um, watch the whole video and all that so thank you um and here listen go on i'll see you as always real soon in the next old video until then please take care of yourselves i love you bye care.